Welcome to NextGen Mentoring Forum. This is NextGen Mentoring Forum. Um, the series is designed to empower, educate, and illuminate individuals who are interested or already in the financial planning industry. As each forum, an expert will discuss the topic in the field of financial planning with purpose of inspiring critical thoughts and discussion. In today's session, I'm very honored to interview Ashley Murphy, who is a CFP, AIF, and CEPA on the topic of what is international financial planning. Pleasure to be here. Thank you so much yes. for, uh, for inviting me on here, Chi Right. Um, my name is Dr. Jolly Jen. I am an assistant professor and director of financial planning program at California Lutheran University. I maintain an active financial planning practice specializing in succession program management at Value Growth Institute. I've authored three award-winning books. Most recent peer review research book is published by Pelgriff Macmillan and entitled Enhancing Retirement Success Rates in the United States. Next Gen Mentoring Forum is sponsored by California Lutheran University School of Management Financial Planning Program. We offer MBA in financial planning that helps financial advisor pursue a leadership position and grow their financial practice by deploying advanced financial planning techniques, effective client communication, financial counseling, streamlined practice management, as well as how to leverage FinTech. Today, we are very, very fortunate to have Ashley Murphy with us. He is a tri-citizen of US, Australia, and UK. He's also the founder and principal of, I'm gonna try this one, Arate, right? Uh, Wealth go, Strategy Australia, fee-only financial planning firm um, in the investment management from the Australia and American expatriates in US as well as Australia. He's also principal and founder of the Global Financial Planning Institute. From 2014 to 2017, Ashley taught the CFP programs at the UC Berkeley Extension and Golden Gate University. We have a lot of things in common there. I haven't taught in those two places, but I know a lot of people uh, oh. taught there. Okay. He also served as a Knowledge Circle host for the Financial Planning Association International and Cross-Border Knowledge Circle from 2017 to 2019, and is a regular conference speaker. He holds a graduate diploma in financial planning in Australia, making him one of the few financial advisors qualified in multiple countries. Ashley has been quoted in Wall Street Journal and uh, profiled in Financial Advisor Magazine. He lives with his wife and two daughters in Minneapolis, Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota. He enjoys cycling, reading, world travel, and is the futurist with interest in architecture, renewable energy, and demographic. My goodness, welcome, Ashley. It's really, really such an honor to have you here. Um, to put things into perspective for, for our audience here, tell us a little, a little bit about where you come across international planning is such a niche, niche, niche business. Mm. Um, so share with us your kind of your, your path uh, to today. Yeah, I, I thank you. It's a it's a pleasure to be here. Also, um, so really, I was born into it. You know, I wish I had a better answer for you as to some incredible story. But I was born in the UK, raised in Australia, and and moved to the US about fifteen years ago. And when I moved to the US, it was just in my head that there must be some forum out there, maybe a website, some sort of organization. If if not that, then at least a book that introduced folks to, to international and cross-border financial planning. But what I found was upon entering the business, there, there actually was nothing. And I spent 10 years looking under every rock, attending every conference and, and inquiring everywhere I could to find out where I could learn more about international and cross-border planning. And it, it just wasn't to be found anywhere. Um, but originally, the, the, I, I got started with the vision of doing what I'm doing now. But it was quite fortuitous, you know, as is often the case when people are telling their stories, right? Um, <laughs> there was a financial advisor I, uh, I had an informational interview with, 
And then about two years later, she had a, a, a client, a prospective client. And she said, well, gosh, this guy's Australian. You're Australian. You must know everything there is to know about financial planning in Australia and cross-border and, and all this stuff. So I'm just going to refer him to you. And, and uh, I was sweating bullets. I was like, oh, my goodness, I better really study up. So that's when I enrolled in that graduate diploma. And I got really busy for a couple of years uh, doing that study as well. And now it's funny that you asked that, that question, uh, Dr. Chen, because only two weeks ago, we finally made the move. I don't think the, the website has been switched off yet, but we had a domestic facing brand and an international cross-border brand. And the, the domestic brand is, is, is about to be turned off. So we only do uh, work with with Australians in America and Americans in Australia. Wow, that's that's fascinating. In terms of when I when I look at your website, I was looking at not just from from the planning itself. To the business model that you have in place is incre incredibly robust. And this is something that I often tell my students that, or even any clients that you really really need to look far ahead to structure your business model well enough. And you actually hit that. Uh, hit that spot. So congratulations for, for the success of, of this area. Now, the questions that I have is that when you talk about Australia and US, obviously the law is different, the tax is different, um, and, and, and lots of different things are different. So how do you actually, uh, how do you actually help clients especially if, if you're talking about just two different countries. I know mm. that most of my clients are not expatriates, but they are certainly wealthy and they yeah. have properties all over the world. Yeah. And they yeah. probably hold more than two citizenships. So how do you help us step us through in terms of what clients are typically looking for and what kind of things that they, it's beyond their, their belief, if you will, that need it, especially for the planning side. Yeah, yeah. I think the, the best way to answer that question would be to determine what stage that client is in in the expat journey. So are they preparing to move? Have they just moved and are getting acclimated? Have they been here for a little while, but they don't really know if they're going to stay? Maybe they're waiting for that promotion or or to meet Mr. or Mrs. Wright. You know, I call those those folks that domicile uncertain, they don't know if they're coming or going. And then there are the permanent movers. There are the folks that have moved over here. Maybe their kids have you know, gotten into grade school or high school, or they've just gotten a fantastic job opportunity. And they said, we're, we're going to stick it out. Uh, the needs differ depending on the stage. But as, as you would know, Dr. Chen, really, there has to be some kind of precipitating event that brings someone to your your office or more more right. uh, accurately these days right. in, in in covid brings them to your zoom uh your zoom room instead there has to be something happening so money in motion something's going on for me i find that is typically uh someone departing the us you know an aussie is departing the us and they say what happens to my 401k? How do I get my money out? How do I not get fleeced by foreign exchange? That, that would be one set of concerns. Another would be Americans in Australia that uh, have accounts, have investment accounts here and are concerned as to their proper management because they, they get in, into all sorts of issues with that. Um, so that's, that's two examples of the, the kinds of issues that, that bring clients to, to me in the first place. Do you, do you then strictly work with ex expatriates? Um, do you work with other people? Like in my example, where I have a client who is a U.S. citizen, well, actually, he doesn't want to clear, declare U.S. citizen because he is a Singapore citizen. Uh -huh. They don't don't recognize dual citizenship. Oh. And she has tons and tons of real estate in in Singapore. So he just kind of maintaining that. He also is a citizen of a Taiwan. So oh. he's actually have juggling all these. So would you be working with someone like that who is not a patriot, expatriate, yeah. but yeah. have properties and citizenships around the different world? I mean, in theory, not that character profile, not, you know, with those particular citizenships as, as you were implying there. Uh, certainly with the, the, the globally mobile Australians, 
Uh, the thing that, that comes into it, though, is compliance. So all of us eventually, you know, will have to be registered, you know, to work in the US and you'd need to figure out what the regulatory stance would be in any of those foreign countries. So Australia, this is a different topic, and I won't go into this in too much detail, but Australia has gone from being a laggard to a leader in terms of compliance. It used to be the case that it was the Wild West, you know, back when I was graduating university, anything went, you know, it was a really, um, let's just say it was, it, you would not consider it a professional service. You know, the, the, the folks that worked in that field, maybe last week were selling shoes or cars or something. And now this week they've decided they're <laughs> they're going to try and sell insurance or mutual funds or, or whatever. But that's all changed. You know, there were a couple major inquiries and the, the regulatory landscape there has been turned on its head. And it's now, I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say, I'm not too proud, don't get me wrong, because it's far from perfect, but um, I'm proud to say it's really the first country in the world where they've made financial planning a true profession, meaning you cannot call yourself a financial planner if you haven't done a degree in financial planning, mm -hmm. if you haven't passed an ethics test, if you have the 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 the, 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 the hurdles of very high, the barriers to entry are, are very high. And, um, but, and I heard from a, a few Australian advisors, if you will, they told they told me that years ago, like what you said, that you, they, they could pretty much do a lot of things. But today, <laughs> not only the degree, the certification that they need to have. But is it also true that it's slowly moving into fee-based and fee-only kind of structure in Australia? Oh, compared to US? It's, there's nothing slow about it. It was, uh, I, I had a presentation at the FPA conference last year and the slide that I depicted to show what happened was, it was, you know, it was, it was shown tongue in cheek, but it was a 1950s atomic bomb detonation, you know, a test, a nuclear test, <laughs> because that's what's happened. It's, there were 2,400. Now, keep in mind, the Australian financial planning business, there's only 20,000 advisors to begin with. Uh, there were 2,400 departures and 15 entrants into the field in 2019. That's what it did. So it, 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 it went fee only. It, they, they've restructured commissions uh, on, on insurance. So that's, it's, a very it's a very difficult environment you know and that's the thing is while i commend them for making this step in the direction of fiduciary and professionalizing the the, the field of financial planning they've gone too far you know they've the the politicians have assumed every financial planner is a crook and is a bernie madoff and so they've had <laughs> oh to come up yeah it's 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 completely ridiculous and we're now seeing the pendulum the regulatory pendulum swing back in the other direction because no one can get advice anymore to do something as simple as this is a good example of how bad it's become down there very often i know this is a next gen group and and you know we're, we're, we're all just getting into the business here but uh, a very very common and easy situation i think you'll agree dr chen would be someone a client who may be in a, have a 401k plan that is d does not look very good. The investments in there are all very expensive, actively managed funds. And you can, as a, as a professional with some experience, you could look at that a mile away and say, these are very average funds at best, very average funds. And it would be an easy recommendation to say, let's move that over into a lower cost alternative. You know, we're not going to you know, recommend necessarily Vanguard or DFA or whatever, although they would commonly be recommended. But if you are moving from a high cost structure to a open platform, low cost structure, it's, it's almost inconceivable to imagine what the disadvantage would be in doing that. And, and does, that, does that mean that from, from your perspective, servicing your clients, these are all the various details, not only from a compliance perspective, but also from fee structure and how to approach clients are all very different in terms of um, different countries' uh, regulations and compliance. Yeah, so so it, it, it just it can, it, yes, exactly. And it, continuing with that previous example, to make as simple a recommendation as that would require that a planner undertake a statement of advice, which would cost a couple thousand dollars, and they'd have to do a detailed fact finding, look at before and after cash flows, 
and and that's all very rigorous and 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 that part is you know maybe you could make the case that that's good honestly i would say it's unnecessary you know clients come to you especially you know a fee only credentialed advisor and they've got a lot of trust they're saying i trust what what you're saying the need to do a full financial plan to justify moving from a low cost product to a to sorry from a high cost product to a low cost product is is unnecessary and so that that can be a barrier to people engaging with advice in the first place is those high fees um, but as for for the business model that my own firm employs we've I've, I've been thank you for your compliment at the outset uh there dr chen it's it's taken a long time to arrive at it and it's i can no longer say that i'm the only firm that has exactly the model that i have because Coincidentally, uh, my friend and and uh, she's a she's a presenter in the GFP Institute, Marina Hernandez, who actually was just interviewed by Michael Kitsis, his Financial Advisor Success podcast uh, interviewed her that came out just Monday this week. Actually, she has the same business model, and and so with clients in all these different countries and you know all the different complexities, we've really had to tweak you know, how we, how we work with them to, to make it profitable. I, th I think she is also in today's uh, attendance. So hopefully that we'll get her to say a few words at the end. Uh, toward really? The end. Is she? Yeah. yeah, I think she is. Um, so my question to you is that um, you gave us two examples of someone who was working in U.S. departing, potentially has a 401k need to get out, or someone who is an American working in Australia yep. that needs some sort of activities in the management in the US. C can you give us an idea of what clients are typically looking for other than the 401k and things like that? Give us a picture of what are they typically facing in terms of what kind of triggers and what kind of planning that, that you typically do for these type of clients? So uh, I'll, I'll take the first part of that. I think what is appealing about the business that, that I have or that, that you yourself would have or Marina would have is that clients are seeking to, to reduce the number of contact points. You know, people are busy and it's difficult to find time, especially if it's a couple, you know, to coordinate their schedules and meet with someone. And so if they can meet with an individual that understands both environments and a third knowledge set that's not taught or mentioned anywhere is it would, and it's not obvious either. And that is, there's obviously the, the US financial knowledge that one would need to have. There's the knowledge of that foreign country that you need to have. But then there's a the knowledge of how the two work together because the, that particular pairwise, that bilateral combination is going to be unique. It, you know, is there a tax treaty? How is, does that tax treaty work? Is there a totalization agreement? Is there an estate tax treaty? What are the relative advantages? You know, If you're speaking with a client and going to the second part of your question, if 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 a client has certain things in one country, are they are those financial products superior in a foreign country, or are they better in the U.S.? Would they be better advised to buy them here or there? Are they portable? Do they travel well? A very common example there would be with Roth IRAs. If you had a purely domestic client, it's pretty common. You know, people would say once you've you know if you're in a given situation, you would do well to think about funding or converting funds into a Roth IRA. Well, for someone who's globally mobile, who might be moving to a country where that foreign country doesn't recognize a Roth IRA and treats it as some kind of foreign ta foreign trust where the growth in that account is taxable, well, you just committed financial harakiri in that you've now, <laughs> you've now taken a tax deductible account we've, or a, a post-tax account that has otherwise tax-free attributes to it, and you've made it taxable. So you get double taxed on it. So that would be an example of, of what not to do. Um, other Can I ask a question before we move on? Is um, You mentioned about tax treaty. Yes. And to your knowledge, and I have heard a few of them, but I'm, I'm not totally understanding these kind of uh, portability or tax treaty kind of policy. To your knowledge, how many of those countries that do you have some sort of tax treaty with U.S. and then uh, what type of uh, type of accounts, such as Roth that you mentioned, actually does make a big difference in terms of these type of type tax treaties? 
Yeah, so th that's a great question. And uh, I'm learning more and more about it all the time. I'm first going to excuse myself um, for, for not knowing even more about it. But and the reason for that is I, I haven't needed to, you know, I focus on one country and therefore I just need to know that tax treaty. However, in teaching the, the, the GFP masterclass on international planning, I've come to learn from the tax attorneys we've had as guest presenters that there's really been a, a couple different templates, if you will, of the, of the tax treaties. And so there was the original templates and then there was an updated template in the early 2000s. Each country's tax treaty does vary though. So there's some generalizations you could make about how retirement account portability works, but maybe the Canadian or the UK treaty might recognize Roths. I know, I think it's a UK one that does, whereas none of the other ones do. Um, and also the, 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 it's important to keep in mind when a particular treaty came into being and what subsequent leg legislation took effect following that point in time. So in the case of the Australian tax treaty, that was signed in 1983 when Ronald Reagan was, was the president. And that coincidentally was a couple of years before the superannuation system came into existence. Superannuation is the name of the Australian retirement system. So how do you have a comprehensive tax treaty that predates the existence of the very retirement system that the whole country uses? That, that brings up tremendous uncertainty. And, and, and so a never ending topic, in fact, there's a webinar I'll be attending tomorrow on this very, on this very topic, um, a never ending topic of discussion is how does the IRS tax these foreign retirement accounts? Because it's, it's not clear. It's not, it's, they're certainly not in the internal revenue code. They're not in tax. Depends on how you interpret that. <laughs> it's, and even just looking at Australia, you can literally shop your opinion. You can, there are, there are tax attorneys out there that would say, no, 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 this, uh, a, a, a superannuation account is in fact, uh, can be deemed a, a, a public pension and therefore it's exempt, it's tax-free. And then you get the most conservative tax attorneys that say, oh, no, no, you've got to pay this tax and that tax and this other tax as well. So, so does that mean that for someone who would like to do this type of work, um, would you suggest them to have a good handful of attorneys, tax attorneys that Absolutely. they yeah. need to kind of bounce off ideas with? Because uh, th this is all depending upon the interpretation yes. in terms of that incident. And that's, that makes it very, very, so the short answer is, and the long answer actually is yes, absolutely. You would, you need to have trusted service providers. The thing is you have to also weigh in a little bit yourself. And that's difficult if you're not an expert, I'm not a tax attorney. Um, but the, the way I've come to take the views that I have is surely these tax treaties weren't written in a way where these expats can get away with paying no tax and be in a position even better than citizens of either country. That just doesn't make sense that that, that would have been the spirit and intention of that law. So, you know, what, what are the more reasonable interpretations? How do we pay some tax to one of the, the governments uh, involved in the situation? Uh, but like you're, you're hitting fact, on a... Uh, if, I, if I may inter inter interject a little bit, I like the fact that you say you have to weigh in based on your knowledge as well as some reasonable interpretation. For example, um, just a couple of weeks ago, I have a client who typically works in Vietnam, China, and Japan, and Taiwan, and is also a US citizen and is also two other citizenships in the other words. Wow. And then they all of a sudden transfer a large amount of sum of dollars into the US and they were in a mm. panic mode to call me. And I'm like, why are you calling me? You already make the transfer. It's a little yeah, bit too late. Yeah. Uh, but what she was explaining to me was, you know, in the US, I am just a single mom housewife. And I said, wait, but you are married. And she said, well, but in that country, I was married, but in US is, and I, I have just kind of like, wait, that's not reasonable. <laughs> you are married, yeah. you are married globally. You can be handpicking in the US, you are considered a single. So do you run into a situation like that in terms of how does advisors actually 
uh, weigh in on, on a reasonable type of interpretation? Yeah, I, I do all the time. And it's, you know, the, the, the blessing of this particular niche is that it is totally underserved uh, and, and the barriers to entry are very high. As a result of that, there are a lot of prospective clients. And if someone is just not advisable, you know, if they're doing something that's not within the letter of the law and they seem as though they're they're not going to comply, then I just don't work with them. I say, you know, yeah. I'm sorry. Well, <laughs> because the complexity is so different in two different countries and you do have to live up to the Bose compliance standards, sort of speak. And it's so or be subject to an exemption or, or have an exemption. So I'm not registered in Australia and I make that abundantly clear right up front. And I say, I know advisors in Australia. I can in broad strokes talk about what the treatment would be. But if you're living in Australia and you happen to be an American citizen, I'm not going to be your, your best bet anyway. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. Someone that lives and breathes, you know, the news cycle, the, the updates in the, the retirement laws and the tax laws, they're, they're going to their FPA presentations every month and hearing about the changes that are happening. It's, it's enough work as it is to stay on top of the, the changes in the US, you know, and, and all that we've had in the past three years, you know, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act and the CARES Act now, SECURE Act, all, oh my goodness, you know, that's just in the US. Try staying up on top of that in, in another country. That's what I do. I, I certainly attempt to do that in Australia. And I think one thing I, I haven't said explicitly, but I would like to hear Dr. Chen is uh, with the GFP Institute, I have found that it really only works to focus on a specific country. You know, those firms, and there are a couple of firms out there that have somehow succeeded outside of that, but they have to very, very uh, narrowly focus their services because th what happens is, and in, in some of the questions you've asked, you're, you're getting at it. If every client is coming from a different country with a different fact pattern, you never stop researching. You can't, you know, put it's the- not enough hours in the day to do this. There's not enough hours in the day. And so that's why I focus exclusively on the country niche that I focus on is because I need to know about, it's a defined area to know about. If some, if some Aussie said, well, I lived in the UK and then I moved to Canada and here and then uh, Zimbabwe and then to the US, I'd say, wow, you know, I, I really can't help you a whole lot with everything in between Australia and the US, but I think there's still a lot of value that, that we can provide. And it's a little parochial, I, a little ethnocentric. It's not intended that way, but it's a fact of life. Morningstar, every, every two years they produce this global fund investor experience study. And in that, they talk about if if you could invest a, a sum of money anywhere in the world, what would your experience be like from a range of different viewpoints, from fees, from uh, the sales environment, from uh, the, the the disclosure environment, and there's there's, uh, the, there's some other attribute. I forget what the fourth one is, but the US actually comes out as number one. And so if you have a client such as, as the one you were alluding to a moment ago, Dr. Chen, then you can honestly say, guess what? If you've got a choice of these five other countries, that's great. But in terms of product availability and costs, the US is number one. So we're in a privileged position in that, in that sense for when doing international cross-border planning. And, and if you, um, and I'm glad that you mentioned about Morningstar global fund study. I think that for those of us that who have clients in that situation, definitely something to read upon. Um, but in terms of the advisor like me or anybody else who just doesn't have the time of the day to do this, how <laughs> would you recommend to partner with you? Or how, how do we go about partner with your firm or someone like your firm to better better service our clients, and we always have to know our limitation, right? right? Yeah. There's always a limitation that we have to 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 be smart enough to refer to someone else, so the client will be better served. So, give us some ideas of what will be the best way to to partner with a company like yours. I think the, it's a it's a great question, and I think the answer actually looks like this. I'm going to give you a long winded answer. Forgive me, I'm not known for my short answers, and I'm I'm not going to disappoint you today. Uh, the, the answer looks like this. You, you really would want to 
make a decision if you're going to work with these clients or not. And if you are going to work with them, then you need to, as per CFP Code of Ethics one uh, three competence, you need to be competent. And so that's why uh, I founded the GFP Institute and offer this masterclass in, in what international cross-border planning is all about. As for really developing expertise in a given country, because that's that's very uh, higher level US centric for inbound and outbound. So Americans moving abroad and expats moving to the US, it's really focused on that. Anytime you introduce a specific country combination, you know, all bets are off because it's so specific to that, that particular country. There's a Canadian planner, a great, great guy down in Arizona. His name's Brian Ruck, W-R-U-K. He runs a firm called Transitions uh, Financial Advisors, and they focus on Canada. And, and Brian, I, when I first met him, if you will, virtually, you know, in the forums, the FPA uh, forums, I thought this guy was a real grouch. You know, because he, he, he would say when when someone would start asking questions about Canada, he would just say, you know, it's really not something you know anything about. You could cause great harm to your clients if you did the wrong thing. So uh, really, the best thing you could do is either study up and make it your focus or simply refer that client to a, to a specialist. And, you know, there, there aren't that many uh, out there, but... There are a handful. There's uh, probably no four firms that focus on that Canada-US uh, combination. But it's it's the same with my firm. You know, I, I like to think that the, the riches are in the niches. You stick to your knitting, focus on what you're good at. And when you encounter someone who is an Aussie, then find someone that, that's made that their career to know about that. Because, you know, we don't do hourly planning. We, we have a finite number of client families that we serve comprehensively and uh, we we like to do our best and put our best foot forward for you know in every client engagement and and so you know I offer that education I've got a YouTube channel but um, yeah we, we 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 graciously accept referrals from from advisors who find that this would be beyond their expertise to be working with with Aussie experts so um, since you have the, the Institute of Global um, Financial Planning, Financial Planning Institute, um, and you have that master class there, do you also provide a list of those niche country that advisors can contact them and, um, and, and potentially work with them? Do you, do you have so, such information there as a resource? Yeah. Uh, uh, you're asking all the right questions here today. So uh, two weeks ago, I was in Miami and we're, we're putting together our plan for 2021. And we're actually doing that right now. So the the uh, the members, so we, we actually just launched this in August of this year. The first class is just coming to an end uh, the week after tomorrow. So 10, 10 lessons. Uh, the first class will finish tomorrow. The next effort that we've got, quite aside from the second running of the class that starts in February, will be to develop a membership platform and to have a find an advisor tool where you could say, I have a client in X country who is moving to or has financial concerns in Y country. I'm seeking an advisor in uh, X country that has expertise in Y country or in you know whatever combination that you want. So that's being developed. And if it was February next year, then I could say, you know, here's the URL. You can you can go and have a look and you know it's it's there, it's up, it's live. So so it's pretty much stay tuned for the February yes. URL to come in. So what um, how help us understand how do you then qualify these people who are niche in those countries? Um, so how do you qualify them? So people like me, who doesn't know much about the international planning, um, going there and do I just blindly trust your recommendation? So yeah. share with us, what is your uh, process of uh, vetting the mouse so then we know this is the right place to go? There's two, two answers to that question. So for the members, what we're doing is we're providing a service provider community as well, so that which is a huge value add right there and goes to a previous question that you had. 
the, the, the thought being, if you have a client, you know, who's a citizen of Taiwan and Vietnam and, and Indonesia and Singapore, all in one, um, where might you find a tax attorney that knows about those countries? And that can be an exceedingly difficult and time consuming task to find that right professional. So what are we doing? We're making an outbound effort. And this is another campaign that's underway. We're making an outbound effort to uh, tax professionals, including uh, CPAs, tax attorneys, estate attorneys, uh, insurance professionals, immigration attorneys to essentially solicit a, a database. Uh, once we get a positive reply from them, so we're, we're essentially emailing them and saying, hey, we're interested in listing you here. Is this something you're interested in? We're not charging them a fee. This is literally for the benefit of the GFP members only. But, so there's no referral fees paid. Um, we would then schedule a call with them and then look at Avo if they're lawyers. Avo is a like a Yelp, if you will, for for uh, for lawyers. And look at Google Maps. We're going to try and find reviews. Look on LinkedIn. We're going to try and do whatever research we can to to justify them. I know that that was an issue that the G, uh, not the, G, the CFP board got into last year in the Wall Street Journal. You might recall they weren't even looking into advisors' disciplinary records. So right out of the gate, we're going to be providing that minimum uh, the minimum level of due diligence on them. We're not we're not recommending them. We're not endorsing them. We're just saying, here are some professionals, some service providers for you to have a look at. With regards to your specific question, Dr. Chen, the, the problem that I found when I was in the international cross-border community was that there was a dynamic that unfolded where the experienced practitioners didn't have an incentive to educate the newbies. Why would they? I mean, that's it's. I hate to say it, and it actually that that dynamic kills me because it's it's not what I stand for. But what you would see again and again would be these people that have invested tens of thousands of dollars and hours, going to conferences, studying, you know, reading journals in foreign countries to develop this expertise, and then what would happen? Someone would get a, a random client in country X you know, wherever that happened to be. And then suddenly they would show up on the forums. Hey, can you tell me everything I need to know to serve this client? What do you, what do you think those advisors, you know, how, how do you think they felt, you know, knowing as much as they know where there are bear traps, there are pitfalls and there are missteps that you can make in this space that could do serious harm to your clients. And it's not, it's not so succinct. You can't just say, oh, by the way, do they have any passive foreign investment corporations? Are they filing their FBARs, their Form 8938s? Are they, uh, do they own US trusts and are they moving to the UK where it's going to result in immediate recognition of whatever gain is present in that trust? It's not possible to go through that. And furthermore, why would you divulge? You know, what incentive is there for these experienced practitioners to divulge and spend all of this time to educate someone that shouldn't be working with that prospect in the first place? The answer I came to was, okay, fair enough. We, we're not going to solve that dynamic. You know, that's a, that's a, it's an industry thing. That's a business model problem. What we need to do is to at least make the education available, make it available so that you could say to the people that are dabbling, oh, by the way, you're in breach of your competence uh, standard, but you don't have to be. So you either have a choice here. You could continue to work with this client and be in breach and you probably nothing will happen, which is a shame, but that's the truth. Probably nothing will happen. Or B, you could focus on this area and really do your best to educate yourself. And that was my intention is I say, we have to fix this problem by providing the education. And so the, the membership to the GFP is not just open-ended like, oh, hey, I want to work with cross-border people. That sounds great. Yeah, let's do that. You cannot even be a member until you've done the GFP class. So it's it's the same reason why we don't allow uh, lay folk outside of the financial planning business in CFP and, and FPA discussion boards because they don't know anything. Right. They're, they're coming from right. an amateur perspective. 
the final answer to, to your question is how to validate specific cross-border expertise. That's really going to come down to the reputation of that, that service provider, looking at their disciplinary history, trying to find reviews, of, although that's difficult because you're not supposed to have them, but you know, people do anyway. Um, in the digital age, it's not possible to suppress them. That's, they've, the SEC's had to change their laws because of that. Um, or revise their interpretation at least uh, because of that. Uh, so we, we would do our, our, our research on an individual basis, but at the end of the day, I'm not an expert in any area other than Australia and the US. And so if someone you know said that they knew everything that was to know about Singapore and the US, then I would say, well, let's just have a look at the reputation, enforcement history, you know, reviews, et cetera, et cetera, to try and ascertain that. But it's not it's not as rigorous as, as you know, we would like that to ultimately be. And so, so I'm, I'm glad that to hear that there is a, a process in place, not only provide the necessary education for those who really want to stay in this kind of niche, at the same time that for those that who doesn't want to stay in the niche that you still have some sort of way to help provide those resources for them. Uh, but I'm going to come from a different angle a little bit. If it's, if it's an expatriate, whether or not they are in the US or in Australia or whichever the country is, I would assume that sometimes um, companies do move their executives across border quite often. Yes. These companies probably are given uh, their part of their package of working with their, the PwC, the KPMG, th those kind of firms in terms of their planning. So what, what do you say for clients who are in that sort of situation, they have some sort of benefits coming in from their employer, but at the same time, they still need some help. How, how could you help a client or the advisors to kind of break the ice and kind of provide that, that um, uh, a platform for them to ac actually benefit the most out of it? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And it speaks to a an oversight that exists in the global mobility employment packages of these executives. Uh, in fact, I've got a great story here. I recently onboarded a client who's a, a senior executive at a Fortune 100 company where they do offer that very package. He, he is Australian, spent a number of years in Singapore, and now he's, he's here in the U.S., and uh, it, coincidentally, they, they did, in fact, put him onto KPMG. The thing is that these packages are devoid of personal financial planning. They don't go into that. It's tax compliance. And furthermore, it's tax compliance that is focused on protecting the employer. Keep in mind the, the you know, I guess I always come back to, you know, incentives determine behavior. And if the, 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 the big four accounting firm is making most of their money from the audit of that company, they may throw in a, an ancillary service package that includes executive tax. Um, but, but who are the people? It's great to see a brand name like KPMG, but who are the people doing that work? Well, they're the local kids that just graduated for, here from the U of M that are working at KPMG. And there may be a partner or two that knows something about that particular country combination, but by and large, they're, they're not the experts that they, they hold themselves out to be. And they, they're working for the employer. And, and what I was coming to here was this executive, he is, is, has fired KPMG, is now seeking his own tax counsel because he's so dissatisfied with the, the, the way that the advice is being provided and the interpretations that they're taking, which are the, the most conservative, you heard me talk about that continuum of, right. of, of conservatism. Well, they don't want to see, the, essentially KPMG doesn't want to see any controversy from any tax decision. And so they, in every instance, they've erred on the side of just paying more tax when there's actually an open debate about what a given treatment would be you know, in, in, a, in a particular situation. I think the world is evolving in the direction that you're referring to. And I point to two recent acquisitions, uh, one of which was Andrew Fisher's firm in San Francisco, World Be Wealth. The other one of which uh, was, was uh, let me think if I can recall his name, gentleman from uh, Toon Financial in Madison, Wisconsin, 
acquired by creative playing. So two multi-billion dollar RAAs that have said, you know what we're seeing is it's such a strange thing to say in the world of COVID with, you know, global lockdowns and no one's been anywhere in a year now, uh, almost. Uh, but the macro trend is that people are, are crossing borders are traveling more. And so I think we're beginning to see the, the very, very uh, start of executive cross-border financial planning services. And, and so that, that was my kind of my, my next questions is that whether or not you see the, the international financial planning demand increase um, and whether or not this um, pandemic have pushed us backwards. What do you think in terms of the demand for these type of international planning? You know, it's funny because I've got a good friend here in Minnesota who's an immigration attorney. And I said, Andrew, how's business doing for you? Because, you know, basically Australia's locked the, the gates. You know, you can't, you, same with New Zealand. You, you can't uh, go in there. You can't travel there unless you're a returning Australian citizen. That's it. And then you, even then they'll lock you in a hotel room for two weeks as I'm about to, to go through in January. Um, that being said, it actually hasn't slowed the flows. It's changed the directions of them. So as a result of uh, the political situation here in the US and all the various issues that you know we've all been through this year on the political front separately the handling of covid uh and it, you know it, it, what, what was it i've done multiple webinars on this but the us comes out the most comprehensive indicator i saw which and which i last reported on in september was the us was ranked 55th in its handling of of the coronavirus crisis it's it's been a nothing but a disgrace and it, and it needs to be said. Not a it's, surprise. It's a complete not a disgrace when you compare it to Taiwan, when you compare it to right. New Zealand, and you compare it to New Zealand, uh, Australia. Now, right. I guess the dear and Vietnam as, as well, and China even. When you compare it to those countries, and China and Vietnam are probably the best comparisons. Australia, Taiwan, and New Zealand—they're all islands, so things get a whole lot easier. You know, if you can, can you can literally just say no one's coming in. Uh, you know, that's that that makes it a lot easier. But people have been turned off by the handling of, of how this this crisis has been has been run. And so they're heading back in the opposite direction. So the demand, if you work in both directions, it really doesn't matter. It just means, oh, people are now heading back in, in greater numbers than what they're headed here. Uh, yeah. and, and I think that the demand, you know, I, I don't think people look at this in terms of pandemic. I think that people are simply looking at from a reality perspective. Many of the clients that I've uh, come across that they always talked about they wanted to move to a different country for retirement. When it comes yeah. to retirement, US is not necessarily the best place to be in terms of cost no. of living and things like that. So many, many people are actually slowly migrating to somewhere else. And so I could only imagine that the demand of these type of international planning will continue to to, to go up as the baby baby boomer is not just in the US, they're across the world. Right. And, and these uh, uh, migration of the retirement eventually will hit a point that this is gonna be very much a niche servicing a very, very um, a niche type of clients for that. Yeah, I, I hadn't actually thought of that before. So I'll give credit where credit's due when that comes up again. But I can imagine <laughs> the niche cross-border retirement planner. That that yes. could be something. I think they'll run into the same problems though, you know, and that every country is different and right. that you have to know every single individual country. But it could be an attractive niche. You could you could have a firm where you deal with say half a dozen countries, you know, Mexico and 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 uh, Costa Rica. Uh, Australia, New Zealand, you know, a couple other countries that, that are very high on the livability index for, for retirees. That would be, that really yeah, would be a, Just a few days ago, a group of us uh, planners, if you will, were comparing all various different countries in terms of retirement. Yeah. And if you are a citizen of a certain country and a citizen of US, there are some advantage to look into, uh, literally go to a different country in terms of the amount of social securities you're gonna get, um, of course, you have to look into the tax treaty as yeah. well as um, 
the global medical insurance, yes. Medicare in U.S. is not necessarily the best things no. out there, but compared to Canada and other countries, right. so there are some advantages to to certainly help help planners to look beyond just just the U.S. Um, it, it is worth mentioning in there a couple things. So first of all. And I didn't mention this earlier, but I think the, the 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 audience here tonight will get a kick out of this one. So the U.S. is one of the only countries in the world, and I mean only one of three. This uh, Eritrea, China has recently started as well. That tax is based on citizenship. Right. So right. if you are an American citizen working on an oil rig in Antarctica or on the moon or in in Zimbabwe or the United Arab Emirates or wherever you've got to pay or, or at least be assessed. You might not owe anything. That's a different matter, but you at least are U.S. Right. accessible. Right. So that's that's a ball and chain that U.S. citizens carry. Now, there are many, I don't mean to be so negative on the U.S. I, I am a, a proud citizen as well. Um, but but it's important to, if we're global citizens, if we're mindful about pros and cons, not everywhere is perfect, then then we can make some comparisons. Another thing is to note is is to do with social security. Social security, unlike the way the aged income uh, pension works in Australia, it's means tested, so it's asset tested right. and income tested. Right. I, I get I get a kick out of explaining to my clients. Warren Buffett goes to his his mailbox every month and gets his social security check. You know, it's an it's an earned entitlement. He he is entitled. To, Bill Gates one day will will collect his as well. It doesn't matter. It, it actually, not only does it not matter, provided you've paid in your 40 quarters and, and done that, it doesn't matter if you're even a U.S. citizen anymore. So you can relinquish right. your citizenship. You could say, I'm done with the U.S., move to a foreign country and still collect your Social Security. It makes no difference. Yes. I've known quite a bit of um, few people that actually done that. And they live not in U.S., but continue to collect Social Security because it's an entitlement system instead. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, we are. We're just. Um, I wish we had more time, uh, but I wanted to ask you one last question, and that oh. is, if you were to give one advice to folks that either are interested in this type of niche uh, international planning or uh, need help with this, what would that be? Yeah, it's. I. I hate to sound so self-serving, but. Please do be fair and keep in mind that I established the, the Global Financial Planning Institute to, to be that first port of call. And so that's what I would say is go check out the GFP, gfp.institute. And yes, .institute is a, <laughs> that is a, a, a web uh, suffix, if you will. Um, and, and have a look at, at that. You know, we've got white papers, blogs. We should be launching a podcast in the new year. Uh, and then, of course, that GFP masterclass. But right there is the educated community where the, we've made a serious effort with with a host of PhD uh, uh, candidates, tax attorneys, tax professionals, insurance professionals, estate planning professionals to put this curriculum together, to put together something that has never been done before. So that that, like I said, it's self-serving, but it's also the best answer. Yeah, and I've been onto that website, so I'm very, very impressed with the curriculum that you have in place. And I wanted to thank you so much for, for spending the time with us to go through lots and lots of different um, practical advice for people who are either interested in this field or at least know about how to refer them out. So we're so very glad that to have you in the Next Gen Mentoring Forum. And uh, this is such an informative session. Thank you so much. And we would love to have you back at some point in the future. Um, right. And I wanted to also thank California Lutheran University School of Management Financial Planning Program for sponsoring today's Next Gen Mentoring Forum. And um, uh, one, one last thing, just uh, quickly go through it. Uh, California Lutheran University School of Management offers the MBA in financial planning, helps financial advisors pursue a leadership position and grow their financial practice by deploying advanced financial planning techniques, effective clients communication, counseling, 
and streamline practice management as well as leveraging FinTech. Please sign up for the info session uh, for more information. Our next session is on December the 9th at 1 p.m. We have Jeremy Wickback, who is a CFA and CP, a CFP, who is going to talk to us about your end investment planning. And so thank you all for attending today. We'd love to see you in the next next gen mentoring form. And thank you, Ashley. Thank you. Have a great holiday. You too. Take care.